All right, you guys, so we're excited uh, to kick off the Secrets to Digestive Health webinar and happy to see all of you that are online now and all of you that are going to be catching the recording um, later on. For me, this is a really exciting topic. Not only is it because the gut is really the gateway to the rest of the body, but it's because digestive health is really what promoted me and got me hooked into functional medicine. Um, my brother almost died of ulcerative colitis when he was 21 years old. He's almost 6'3 and weighed 122 pounds. And my mom struggled with chronic digestive complaints for 20 plus years. At one point, she was down to being able to only eat five foods. So what I took away and when I found functional medicine is digestion is complex. It's a complex system and needs to be treated holistically, right? Rather than myopically and looking at it at, you know, in a, as a single single organ or single system. And so that's what we're going to be sharing with you today. And then Dr. Kat Lewis is also on today and um, she'll do her introduction as well. <clears throat> yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Kat Lewis and I entered functional medicine um, from a completely different aspect. Well, I also got sick too. Um, and a lot of what you'll see is a lot of functional medicine practitioners actually uh, go into functional medicine because they couldn't heal themselves with the conventional model. Um, so, but really I was working for a biotech for many, for about 20 years and I was in and out of pharmaceutical companies. They were really our bread and butter. And I always had pretty good lifestyle habits. I started running when I was like 15 years old and I ate pretty well, or I ate really well. I ran, I was running, I was, um, I had good sleep habits. I had a lot of good lifestyle practices, but I still got sick. And I was watching um, con the, con you know, the conventional model, um, biotech, the pharmaceutical companies, and I was looking at them just focusing on drugs and really not lifestyle. And I could see that we were spending billions and billions of dollars every year on, on trying to find one drug to address a complex issue. And then also looking at all the money we were spending on the industries to support these biotech companies. And I was just like, it's really simple. You know, I'd sit in these audiences and watch these conferences. And I was like, it's really actually way more simple than this. We just need to teach people how to, what the body needs to be healthy. And really what science is showing us now is that all, everything, most of what we classify as disease is really the body just aging. The body's not getting what it needs. And so it slowly starts to break down. And so a lot of the chronic issues that we, uh, we talk about are really just that the body's aging. It's not getting what we need. So we're really in the business of teaching you what the body needs to thrive. Okay. So this, this is actually, I just wanted to put this up here. I'm not going to go over her story right now. Um, but this is a testimonial from one of my clients and she had gut issues that she was suffering from for 20 years. And you can see her, um, her testimonial here just after a few months of working together. Okay, so welcome to the secrets to digestive health and how gut restoration may be that one thing you need to completely turn your life and your health around. Okay, so the game plan is we're gonna talk about some of the, the science, um, the new science on gut health and the role of the microbiome and the drivers and hidden stressors of poor digestive health. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the testing that you can do at home. That's not really something that your doctor is gonna offer you. And then we're gonna show you how an approach that really works to help heal the gut so you can get your life back and feel like yourself again. So Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. And so Hippocrates 2,500 years ago was considered or is even now considered the father of uh, modern medicine, okay? And 2,500 years ago, he said this, and it's really just now, 2,500 years later, that the Western world is really discovering because of all the, tech, the new technology, modern science is helping us understand the role of the gut in our health. And so research has been focusing on the microbiome. And the microbiome is really all the bugs in your gut and throughout the entire body, but most of them reside in the colon. 
And we're actually more bacteria than we are human. Do you guys know that? Um, the first estimates were around 10 to one bacterial cells per, per human cell, but now it's around like three. The estimates are around about three to one. Um, and the microbiome refers to not just bacteria, but also viruses, archaea, which are little bugs that are similar to bacteria, but they're different, um, parasites, uh, fun fungi that are all live and populate uh, the, the body. In the gut, the mass of these bugs is about two to six pounds. So it's equivalent to your brain. And some people are calling this the second brain. They, it's over a hundred trillion organisms, greater than 10,000 unique species. And their genetic load is anywhere from hundred to 500 to one of ours. That means their genes, their gene population is anywhere from hundred to 500 times our genes. And this is important because those genes are coding for certain chemicals, molecules, peptides, uh, proteins that are influencing our health. And what they're showing is that really the microbiome determines whether we have health of disease and really determines, you know, affects all aspects of human life, not just our physical health, but also our mental, emotional health. They help us digest foods. They help us produce vitamins, hormones, and neurotransmitters. They protect against the colonization of harmful bacteria. So not all bacteria is harmful. We've been kind of told that. And so we have certain practices that we've been doing, like not letting our kids get dirty, washing our hands too much, using too many antibiotics. So those kinds of things, we, we destroy the microbiome when we do that. So, but because they're actually helping protect us, they're, they're also maintaining the lining of the gut wall, they modulate our immune system, they, do, they help regulate our blood sugar, they influence our weight, um, what foods we, we want to eat, and our cognitive ability, and also our mood. So they affect our behavior, our, whether we're um, feeling satisfied, um, learning and memory and mood, anxiety, depression, for example, and whether we can focus or not. So here's just some of the research that I wanna go over. So <clears throat> this is just a review of dietary microbial connections between depression, anxiety, and stress. And what they found is that the, this preclinical evidence does suggest that the bugs are influencing our mood and behavior. They really, what some of them do is they hijack the amino acids that we use for neurotransmitters, they turn them into something else and then we don't get them, right? So then we, that affects, you know, our ability to focus, it affects how we feel. So like anxiety, depression, it, aff it affects, it gives, it leads to behaviors like OCD or Tourette syndrome, schizophrenia, things like that. Okay, so this, this is some of the research that was done at Caltech where they looked at the effect of the microbes on our weight, on the body's ability to store weight. And what they did was they took these mice that were grown in a germ-free environment, so that means they're free of any bugs. And then they took four sets of twins, three fraternal and one identical set of twin, human twins, where one of the twins was obese and one was not obese. And what they did was they took their microbiome samples and they infected it in these mice. And what they found is, as you can probably guess, <laughs> right, the, the obese twin, the, the mice that received the microbiome from the obese twin became fat. And then the mouse that took the lean twins microbiome, they stayed thin. They did, repeated the study and they did another experiment where they actually put the mice in the same um, cage at the same time. And what they found was, so they're eating the same food and they were originally in this initial experiment as well, but they repeated this experiment and they put the, the mice together. And what they found was that the lean or the fat mice became lean. And that's because this is like an unappealing mouse behavior, but what they do is they eat their fecal matter. <laughs> so that's how it was thought that, that they were able to achieve that. <clears throat> okay, so here's another example of, or here's an example of how the microbiota, and that's another term that you'll hear when referring to the microbiome. So the microbiome refers to all the bugs and their genes, and the microbiota just refers to the bugs. So this is showing um, in a Parkinson's model of mice that they, what they did was they took people with Parkinson's disease, they took their fecal matter and put it into mice germ that were raised in a germ-free environment. And they found that mice that were, were, that got the fecal matter of people with Parkinson's had Parkinson's-like behavior. Whereas mice that got fecal matter from people who did not have Parkinson's 
um, did not exhibit that behavior. Okay, so there's numerous, numerous, numerous studies like this out there right now on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, um, diabetes, uh, much, a lot on cognitive behavior. Um, so I invite you to check all of that out. So the type and amount of bacteria varies throughout the entire body, but they're covering us from head to toe, okay? In the, no in the nose, in the mouth, on our skin, and all through the digestive tract. Most of them reside in the colon, so the large intestine, okay? So you can see these numbers. The numbers, like the last one, one times 10, 10, 10 to the 10th or 11th, that means one with 10 decimal places behind it, or 10 zeros, not 10 decimal places, but 10 zeros behind it. So there's trillions of these bugs on our bodies. Okay, and they colonize in different areas depending on the pH in the body. They're doing important jobs for us. And what's key here is diversity, 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 diversity. And what contributes to diversity is what we're eating. The foods that we're eating, um, we can wipe them out by antibiotics. We can wipe them out by certain foods that we're eating or not eating because they're feeding the healthy bugs, the ones that we need are actually feeding off healthy food choices. So this is just another way that the universe is telling us, go towards what mother nature grew. If God didn't grow it, don't eat it, <laughs> right? And because it turns out that things that God grows or nature grows is actually what these healthy bugs feed off of and therefore they give us health. So studies on um, showing the effects of, my, um, of antibiotics on the gut is showing that after um, this is a seven day treatment of a um, antibiotic. It show, it's showing that after nine months, you still don't have the diversity. So this is on zero days. Those different colors are indicating the different species of bugs that exist. You see on day seven, there's, there's really just one type of bug that exists. And then day 21, three months, six months, nine months, still just one type of bug. You really don't get any diversity back until not even close to the diversity of the original day, of day one, um, even after two years. So that shows you that when you, you know, when you use these antibiotics, which we've been using for years and years because it was thought that these bugs were bad for us, that it really wipes out our, our gut microbiome, right? And that's not good for us. And Kat, what so I do want is, to say really quickly with that is, yeah. It, not just, so at this point, if you are doing antibiotics, there's interventions and we're going to talk about them that you can utilize to get your gut microbiome back up. So for, for the time, don't think, oh God, dear God, I'm, I'm doomed because yeah. I took antibiotics, right? Because it, antibiotics and sometimes are going to be some life-saving, you know, options for you. Um, but do know there are, it just means that you must use some interventions, alongside your antibiotic to get your gut diversity back. It's not just gonna come back just through a healthy diet at that point, or it's gonna take exponentially longer, right? We can support it with foods, but we're gonna share some of those interventions uh, later on in the presentation. Yeah, and so that's really important to note. Thanks, Carrie, for bringing that up at this point, because <clears throat> um, you know your con conventionally trained doctors are not trained on this, and so they don't know how to coach you into repairing the gut. So they give you antibiotics, and you're kind of left to your own devices. And because you don't understand how this works, then it doesn't come back, right? But when you understand how it works, there's definitely interventions that we can use to address this. So we just want to do a pre brief overview of the digestive tract. And this is not a biology course, but it's really important, I think, for people to understand how their body works so that that empowers you um, to keep yourself well. So digestion really starts when we start either thinking about food or, or smelling food. What happens is the saliva, salivary glands start excreting um, digestive enzymes and the saliva, which helps break down the food. So you want to think of the digestive system as an assembly line, right? So the the person at the front of the assembly, assembly line, if they're not doing their job right, right, at the end of the assembly line, it's gonna make it harder for those people to do their job. And so that's really what this is, a series of organs that's assembly line. So if the, we start chewing the food within the mouth. If we don't chew well, that's gonna make the stomach's job harder. If we don't, if the stomach doesn't work properly, then it's gonna make it harder for 
um, us to extract the nutrients from the food in the small intestine. Okay, so we start chewing the food in the mouth. It goes into the esophagus and that's kind of automatic, goes down into the stomach. The stomach releases hydrochloric acid, acid and enzymes and like churns the food. It's like a washing machine. It churns the food up and then it releases it into the small intestine and the, there's enzymes secretions that are that are secreted into the small intestines to help break down the food and extract the nutrients and the nutrients most of the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine and then that moves then into the colon where water is extracted from it, it and then a little bit there's some there's bugs in there that extract more calories from the food and then it moves out into the um the rectum and then you hopefully get rid of it Okay. Okay. So the obvious signs of poor digestion, we kind of all know this, right? Heartburn, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, stomach pain, nausea. Maybe you've been diagnosed with IBS or IBD and IBS really essentially means you have irritable bowels and we don't know why. So we're going to give you this label of IBS and call it a day. <laughs> and then we're just going to, I don't know, you know, you're kind of left on your own devices. Um, and a lot of times we ignore these symptoms because we just take them to be normal or we get antacids and then that suppresses the heartburn. So we just kind of live with these things day in, day out. <clears throat> Less obvious signs of poor digestion are food allergies, candida overgrowth, skin conditions, allergies, asthma, right? Nutritional deficiencies, um, iron, for example, anemia. Um, B12 or vitamins and minerals, um, fatigue, you're feeling tired all the time, joint pain, so pain and inflammation in the body, depression, anxiety, brain fog, so you can't think clearly, you can't complete tasks, you can't remember people's faces or names very well, insomnia, lung and sinus issues, and also autoimmunity. So these are all signs of poor digestive health. So how does it go wrong? Really, it's stress. But we're gonna redefine stress because we all know stress is mental, emotional stress, but it's not just mental, emotional stress. It's also um, what you're eating, lack of sleep, lack of exercise. It's what, you're, what foods you're eating or not eating and nutrient deficiencies and also infections within the body and mostly in the gut. So this is what's happening in your gut in response to stress. So the left side of this image shows you what a healthy gut would look like. So you see these cells, they're called epithelial cells and they line the inside lining of the gut wall. So mostly in the small intestines, what these look, this is where the, they look like this. They look like little fingers or a, a toe-like protrusions and that maximizes the surface area for absorption for the food, okay? And it's just a single layer of cells and they fit nice and tight together, hopefully, right? So that helps create a protective barrier from the inside, the lumen of the gut into the body. But when we're under stress, what happens is those cells start to peel away from each other, okay? And so things that shouldn't be getting in like gluten or microorganisms, toxins are now getting in to the bloodstream. Your immune system is right there. Two thirds of our immune system is in the gut. It sees these things as not self and it launches an immune response against them. So you have this low grade inflammation that over time, the inflammation is really what causes disease. Okay, so the most common gut stressors are food intolerances. So wheat and refined oils, overconsumption of sugar, so processed food. So again, if, nat if mother nature didn't grow it, don't eat it. <laughs> um, the, par the problem with wheat in our country today is that they've, they've hybridized it. So they made it more glutinous, but they're also spraying our food. They're spraying many of our crops with um, uh, an herbicide called Roundup which contains the active ingredients called glyphosate, <laughs> which causes a lot of problems. There's lots of lawsuits. They've now, that company that sold that has been bought by another company and they're kind of selling it under a different name. So just be aware of that. Processed foods because they don't have enough nutrients, right? And uh, use of medications like pain medications, Tylenol, ibuprofen, so routine use of that um, also disrupts the gut. Birth control pills, steroids, and other medications. Um, my, microbial toxins. Um, so the, 
the chemicals produced by the microbes themselves. So when you get an imbalance of those gut micro, my, the, the, those microbes, they can start producing an overabundance of certain types of chemicals, and then that's going to stress the gut as well as you stress your brain. Um, so we can have candida overgrowth. Parasites can cause problems in there if we don't have the right mix of bugs, and then chronic stress. So immediately when we're stressed, our immune system is suppressed and then we're more susceptible. So in the organ functions of the digestive system also react to that stress. So everything's kind of working at a lower capacity and therefore we're not getting, um, we're not as protected. So for example, when you're under a lot of stress, and this is something I didn't go over in the previous slide, but when you're under a lot of stress, you're gonna start producing less hydrochloric acid. So in the stomach, when we release stomach acid, we want to release that stomach acid because it helps digest the food, but it also helps protect us against those bugs that are coming into through the digestive tract, right? So if that stomach acid is adequate, those bugs won't make it down into the small intestine and the colon. So Kat, what I would like to mention here, um, you know, when people go, okay, well, what are the what are the most important things to look at is looking back at glyphosate. Glyphosate was actually patented as an antibiotic. It's not patented as an herbicide. So we know the devastation antibiotics use. So making sure that you're minimizing when we say processed food, it's GMO foods because all GMO foods are sprayed with glyphosate, obviously wheat as well is really, really important. Um, so just, you know, and we'll again, get into those, but that's something to right off the bat, if you have chronic digestive issues or a laundry list of other nagging symptoms, going organic or sustainable, growing your own food is gonna be really important, but, and getting, um, getting rid of, you know, glyphosate in, you know, within your home, as well as uh, within your food source. The CDC just came out recently the last two weeks showing that 80% of urine samples they sampled have glyphosate in it. Yeah. So it's an airborne toxin. It's hard to get away from, but those are gonna be some of the steps that you can start to get away from. Yeah, so even okay. if you're, yeah, yeah, thanks Carrie. If, even if you're eating organic, it's good to wash the food because um, you can have an organic farm that's downstream from a, a, a farm, farm that's not organic. And because this is airborne, it could, they, when they spray it, it will go into the other farm. And it also gets into the water supply. So even if you're eating organic food, it's really important that you start cleaning the food. Um, so this is, I've been following Dr. Faziano for many, many years. And he is actually one of the, he specializes in celiac disease and has done a tremendous amount of research on leaky gut. Um, one of the first people to actually term uh, the, the, the term, use the term leaky gut. And what he had found is that there's a growing, you know, growing evidence that increased intestinal permeability, quote unquote, leaky gut is playing a really huge role in these autoimmune diseases. Things like type one diabetes, Hashimoto's, um, and as the laundry list that we shared before, it pretty much all autoimmune disease. We always, always look back in the gut. So the importance of this, as we said, this is the gateway to the rest of the body. And, you know, one of the things that I have seen go wrong repeatedly and where I feel like is a lot is goes unaddressed many times is actually in the stomach. Um, and so in the stomach, Ken, if you can forward, it'd be great. In the stomach, this is where I start to see a lot of things go wrong is we start seeing whether it's because of age, chronic stress, the use of antacids or non steroidal or anti-inflammatories, uh, anti bacterial imbalances, and then just poor acid balance. Well, all of those things actually drive poor acid balance in the stomach. We start seeing, as we say, upstream starts to go south. And that's when we start seeing things go wrong in not only in the stomach, but we also start seeing things go wrong in the small intestine and colon. And so the stomach, as Kat had mentioned earlier, really, really important because not only is it produced hydrochloric acid and pepsin, but it also produces intrinsic factor, which is incredibly important for the breakdown and absorption of B12, as well as your immune response. And we know B12, when you're pregnant, B12 is one of the most important nutrients to grow a healthy baby. Same thing as it's one of the most important nutrients to grow a healthy body. It helps with DNA production and very much linked to low levels of energy in the body. 
So if your acid levels are low, even if you're eating good amounts of protein or even taking a B12 supplement, your body's ability to actually absorb and break down that B12 is going to be um, interfered with. So um, also it's the first line of defense, right? You lower your acid levels and antacid we'll talk about in a moment, but you lower your acid levels, you do not have that first line of defense against food borne pathogens. Things like E. coli, right? You have adequate acid levels, E. coli you're gonna get exposed to and you might not get sick. So, um, you know, a telltale sign, if you're someone who gets quote unquote food poisoning often and you're eating with others that aren't getting it, you want to look in your stomach to make sure uh, you've got adequate acid levels because if you do, um, your chances of getting sick from those food burn pathogens is gonna be minimal. And then it also obviously helps break down food and really important, it helps to stimulate pancreatic enzymes, right? Enzymes that break down protein, carbs, and, and uh, fats in the body as well as absorb minerals. And one of the common causes, this is the most common cause of heartburn and ulcers. Um, and Kat, you know what? I don't know if you can, looks like we're getting a little background noise we just need. Really? I don't hear anything. Yeah, I'm hearing the background noise. I don't know. Um, I think it's fine now. Um, so H. pylori is one of the most common causes of heartburn and ulcers. It's also the most common cause of stomach cancer. It's a very, very common bacterial infection. Again, if you have adequate stomach acid, you may be exposed to H. pylori and it's not gonna make you sick and it's not gonna cause you to have heartburn and or ulcers. However, someone else may actually have the beginning of stomach cancer because of this common bacteria. You get it from swapping spit from one another. You can get it, you can share it sharing water or food. You can also get it from your dogs and you can give it to your dog. So be aware, maybe not allowing your dogs to kiss you on the mouth and vice versa. Um, the best test is a stool antigen test for this. And I'll tell you, there's a high, high rate of false negatives for this test. So I'll have people say, oh, I've already been tested for that, but they have an ulcer, um, which means more than likely you have H. pylori that has just gone undetected. The most common test is called a breath test. Um, high rate of false negatives. So if you don't catch some really powerful herbs, which we're going to share at the end of this webinar, that do an incredibly good job of balancing the bacteria and also getting rid of this bacteria in your stomach if it's causing problems. The other common um, imbalance that we find with clients is if you have an aha moment, when I have a client who comes in and says, they can tell me the specific day that they got sick and their digestion has not been the same sense, or they know they got Montezuma's revenge or food poisoning and their gut has not been the same sense, most likely it's because of a parasitic infection. Post-infectious IBS, very, very common. Um, you get diagnosed with IBS years after having a parasitic infection when really it's because of the damage caused by the parasite and perhaps the parasite is still um, uh, active in the body. So um, very, very important um, on the, you know, to make sure that you get tested. With medical textbooks, medical textbooks say in order to rule out a parasite, you need 10 negative stool samples. No doctor is going to run 10 negative stool samples. So if you get a negative stool test, it does not mean, oh, I'm clear. I've been tested for parasites. I'm fine. It means you can only be ruled in with a, paras with a parasite uh, test through parasite testing rather than ruling out. Now, um, I love Dr. Mark Hyman. He's an integrated physician. He's actually the head of the Functional Medicine Club Clinic at the Cleveland Clinic, right? One of the most prestigious and reputable um, medical systems in the US. And it's really important because antacids are popped like nothing. I have clients that have been on a proton pump inhibitor, you know, prescription antacid for 20 plus years and are wondering why they have chronic constipation and why they have quote unquote IBS and SIBO. Um, and it's more than likely the antacid use has driven it and making it exponentially worse. And acids have never been approved for long-term use, no more than six weeks. So even if your doctor says, oh yeah, sure, it's fine, right? They have never been tested for more than six weeks of use. And um, Mark Hyman has said that it is one of the most 
damaging, right, drugs on the market today. And the reason being is because it lowers your hydrochloric acid levels, right? Hydrochloric acid, the fallacy is that, uh, that acid reflux is because of too much acid. That's not the case at all. Acid reflux is generally because of an intra-abdominal pressure pushing up, so bloating in the small intestines, perhaps even a higher hernia, causing the stomach to push, to push up on the stomach and to cause an acid splash in the esophagus. So because your acid levels, the you know, pharmaceutical company said, hey, we've got a great solution. We're going to lower your acid to nearly zero. Not thinking about the effects that no acid have on the rest of the body, right? So it increases your risk of kidney disease. The reason being is because you cannot break down and digest protein adequately, making your kidneys work much, much harder. Death from C. difficile, which is a common bacterial infection. You should get sick for, you know, causes explosive diarrhea for three days and get over it. But because your body does not have the immune defense, first line of defense is that acid. You can actually, I have a client who was in ICU. Um, she's been on antacids for 25 years because she had a C. difficile uh, infection. And then it all depletes nearly every single nutrient, particularly B12, folate, calcium, iron, and zinc. If you are having an issue with osteoporosis or osteopenia, antacids, the calcium that they have in it, it's not going to make a difference because you can't absorb it. <laughs> so we got to fix your acid uh, levels in your stomach. One of the national remedies we have for heartburn remedies, instead of popping in an acid, one and most important is we have to get to the root of why you have acid reflux in the first place and heal it. But in the meantime, if you're wanting to start to wean off your antacid or find a solution that actually helps improve absorption, helps with metabolic function and gives you relief, it also helps with the absorption of protein, fats and um, minerals, take two teaspoons of raw apple cider vinegar add it to four ounces of water. You never want to take the apple cider vinegar and shoot it raw. It will be too acidic for your esophagus, but it actually is more alkalizing once it gets into the stomach. So um, super easy way um, to start working on, you know, starting to improve your digestion, getting away from some of those antacids as you're looking and working with someone to get to the root cause of your heartburn in the first place. So this is one of my clients. Um, her name is Sarah and she's 29 years old. She came to me because she had chronic diarrhea since she was in fourth grade and stomach pain. She also had a tremendous amount of anxiety and you'll see her before and after. One of her goals was not weight loss. However, this is a total transformation after four months of working together. We started with a gut test that we'll be showing you next. And within four months, she had lost over 15 pounds. But the biggest thing is you just see her bloat is gone, right? The systemic bloat, inflammatory water that she was carrying, her chronic diarrhea went away. She was diagnosed with IBS when she was in fourth grade. And her IBS, believing that her IBS was driven all by anxiety, it's all in her head. But we found some massive food sensitivities, started to remove some gut irritants, and worked on gut healing and this was her transformation. So the test that um, we're talking about um, we is a in-home gut test. And Kat, do you wanna, do you wanna show? Um, Can I pull that up? <clears throat> yeah, sample test, awesome. Kat, Kat's gonna walk through <clears throat> this. This is a test that is not run by traditional MDs unless they are an integrative MD or functional medicine trained because not only do they not know how to interpret this test, but they don't have the solutions because they haven't been trained on the solutions on how to balance your gut microbiome, how to improve pancreatic function, how to improve liver gallbladder function, right? There's no medications for that. It's really about your lifestyle, diet, and um, supplementation to help with this. Yeah, natural remedies <clears throat> that have been around yeah. for a long time. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this is a one of the tests we often use, which is called the GI map. And um, you can see, so the major bars here are the categories of bugs that they're looking at. So pathogens are bugs that are known to cause disease in humans. So here are some bacterial pathogens that we're looking for, some parasitic pathogens, some viral pathogens. And then if you scroll down, <clears throat> so this person has H. pylori. <clears throat> 
Um, so this person, he's 61 years old, uh, male, and he he came because he had no he had no complaints about digestion, absolutely none. He was complaining of brain fog, ADD. Um, he was tired, like really tired all the time. He had problems sleeping. He was on, he had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. He was pre-diabetic, right? So he'd been feeling bad for a while. <clears throat> and so we ran, I always want to run a gut test. It's one of the first places we look, even if there's no digestive complaints, right? So, so he had H. pylori. See, this test is also looking for normal bacteria, right? So that's something that your doctor is probably not going to be looking for. So these are some of the keystone bacteria that we need because they're doing important jobs for us. And so some of them were out of balance. <clears throat> these phyla are really the families of these bugs. No, that's your gut microbiome, you guys. Those are the strains <laughs> of your gut microbiome. When we talk about gut microbiome, these are just a handful of your gut microbiome. Yeah. So we get to see, what do you need? If someone goes, do I need a probiotic? I go, I don't know. Let's see. And what type of strains do you actually need if you do need some? Yeah. Or what kind of foods do you need to grow yeah. the ones that you don't have, right? So that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at. So opportunistic bacteria are bacteria that are normally found in the gut, but when the host is compromised, they can take over. And so here they've got a handful of he's got a handful of overgrowth. He's got a lot of overgrowth here. So with what, what, what term you may hear is dysbiosis. And that means there's an imbalance in the, in the gut microbiome. So either there's, there's bugs that we don't want in there, or there's an overgrowth of certain types of bugs um, and an undergrowth of certain type of bugs, or there's also a, a dislocation of those bugs. So like SIBO, you might hear the term called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. What that means is some of the bugs from the colon, right? Because the colon has the highest concentration of bugs. Some of those bugs have moved into the small intestine where they don't belong. And then that can cause problems too. So, um, so here he's obviously got a high, a, a lots of overgrowth here. And then he's got, so these are categorized as potential autoimmune triggers. Doesn't mean they cause autoimmune but they are associated with autoimmune. So he's got quite a few of those. Um, this is not the best test for uh, looking at um, fun fungi and yeast, but it does, it can detect them. We have another test for that. Um, here's again, a couple of viruses that it looks for, and here's some parasites. So we had two parasites. Again, he was not complaining of any digestive symptoms, none. Okay. Oh, we know his digestion wasn't working because mm -hmm. of the laundry list of chronic symptoms he had. Yes. And <clears throat> here is um, some intestinal health markers, right? So this is looking at digestion. So how well are you digesting fat, right? So this one was high, so he does have fat in his stool. Elastase is a marker for the pancreas. It's an enzyme that the pancreas produces. It makes its way through the colon. And so that's why we use it as a marker for determining whether your pancreas is, is um, uh, producing enough enzymes. And so his is low. Um, these are some other GI markers here. So this is just a bug. This is a, a something that can influence the, the recycling of toxins within the body. Um, here's some immune markers. So secretory IgA. This is actually one of the first lines of defense against the outside world. It's in the nasal passages in the mouth and the mucosa that lines the gut. And it really um, protects us against an infection. So when that's low, which, and it goes down really fast with stress, right? So when that's low, then you're not protected. And then if your stomach acid is low to boot, then you're really not protected. So um, anti-gliadin, so IgA, this is, um, this is, uh, gliadin is a protein in gluten, okay, in grains. And so if this is high, um, we know that you're gluten sensitive, at least at the lining of the gut, okay? But, so it's just one marker for gluten sensitivity. And then calprotectin is an inflammatory marker. So people with IBD, so um, inflammatory bowel disease, this will tend to be higher in there. Okay, now, so, Kat, yeah. one of the things that okay. I wanted to mention is, you know, what these markers are indicative of. So when we see those opportunistic bacteria elevated like there was on his test, this is one of the most common drivers of gas, stomach pain, and bloating. So when we see this, this can be a, indicative of SIBO, that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth you added, but it does help us really start to identify, um, you know, is this what's driving? It can also be a big driver of chronic diarrhea and a big driver of constipation, depending on what we see. 
the, um, you know, fat, finding fat in your stool is an indicative of how well your gallbladder is functioning. So we get a lot of information rather than that having to do invasive tests or ultrasounds on, you know, do you have a problem with your gallbladder? Well, right here, we're seeing some precursors showing that your gallbladder is struggling and we need to address that so that you don't get gallstones and or don't need to have your gallbladder removed. You, are you starting to have signs of inflammation? When we start seeing your secretory IgA low like that, it's indicative of chronic stressors. So we know we need to look at, do you have parasitic infections? Do you have bacterial overgrowth? Do you have proper acid levels in your stomach? Do you have chronic food sensitivities, right? Or maybe there's a viral component. So it's not only just giving us information of like, oh, you've got low secretory IgA, this is what we're gonna do, or you have fat in your stool. It's giving us so much information so we get to start having a systematic blueprint on how to address it. So what happens is when you work with someone like us, we send you these tests, you collect the sample at home. It's not fun collecting your stool, but it's convenient because you don't have to go anywhere. And then it's a prepaid envelope. They give you a little freezer bag, you freeze it, you send it back to them in this prepaid envelope and we get the results and then we go over them with you and then create a plan to address these things. Okay. So if you've got bloating, um, you know, one of the big things uh, that, or IBS, we now know, quote unquote IBS, thanks to uh, Monash University out of, out of Australia, that 80% of IBS cases are actually caused by SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, right? It's having bacteria in the small intestines where it shouldn't be there. It causes fermentation of a lot of the healthy foods, particularly high fiber foods. So, you know, you've, let's say you've chronic constipation because IBS can cause chronic constipation. It can also cause diarrhea. And your doctor tells you, oh, just make sure you're eating a lot of fiber, add in more fiber. That is actually can cause just a bomb to go off in your gut if you've got SIBO and you'll know it pretty quickly because you're going to have a lot of symptoms and pain. So you have to get to the root cause of SIBO. Um, SIBO is secondary, right? We don't go, oh, you've got SIBO, you've got IBS, great. We found out you have SIBO. Why do you have SIBO in the first place? We need to look at your stomach health. We need to look at your colon health. We need to look at how well your, your digestive tract is actually functioning mechanically as well. Um, so some of the remedies for bloating is to, there's a fabulous app from Monash University, it's M-O-N-A-S-H University. Um, and they, I think it's 9.99, it's well worth it. And it's to follow a low FODMAP diet. FODMAP is an acronym and it basically um, takes out the foods that are easily fermentable. And this diet is not a diet you're supposed to stay on long-term because that can actually be harmful to your colon health. But it is a great tool to utilize. Try a low FODMAP diet strictly for seven days to see if you're bloating and bloating and stomach pain improves. That's the one thing that you should see a dramatic improvement is stomach bloating. And if you do, in fact, then you need to address, you need to get rid of your SIBO and you need to work on improving your digestion so it doesn't come back. Because you'll start seeing people who have had SIBO who said, oh, I had to, you know, I've gotten rid of it several times and it just comes back. And that's because they're not addressing the root cause of why they have it in the first place. Digestive enzymes can be very, very helpful if you're low in enzymes. If you're not low in enzymes, enzymes aren't going to make a difference. Bitters, they come in tinctures. Um, a lot of things like tannins, cilantro, parsley, a lot of our natural herbs also are natural bitters. Lemon, right? Um, or lemon rind, what's in the lemon rind, can help stimulate hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, celery juice can do the same thing, as well as salt, sea salt. Sea salt, adding a little bit of sea salt to your water in the morning, warm water with lemon, helps with bile production, helps increase your bacterial or your digestive fire. Um, you must knock down bacterial levels with SIBO. It will not go away on its own. Most, 99% of the time, you must address it and then optimize digestion. <clears throat> so if you are experiencing constipation, bloating, indigestion, GERD, IBS, IBD, right? Any of those classic digestive imbalances, it is going to, one of the biggest things as Kat had mentioned, one of the, you know, issues with gut stressors and it's these endotoxins or mycotoxins, microbial toxins. The body, when you have an overgrowth or 
uh, an imbalanced digestive system, your need to get rid of toxins is exponentially higher than someone else's. So you may have edema, you may have more water weight, you may feel like you're getting more joint inflammation, fatigue, brain fog is a big sign and symptom mm -hmm. that your body is overloaded with toxins. And you may be like, hey lady, I have, you know, eat organic, I eat really healthy, I exercise, but if your digestion is out of balance, you may have a very high toxic microbial load, which is going to slow down the liver. Some of the other signs and symptoms that you're needing some detox is alcohol intolerance. Are you suddenly now struggling to break down alcohol or get hungover or feel crappy after one or two cocktails? Big sign that you're needing some additional support. Skin issues, another big sign that you're needing additional support. So it can be an overabundance of yeast, bacteria, molds, and just those mycotoxins. Now alcohol, this is the slide that everyone goes, I don't want to listen to this. I'm just going to leave, leave, leave the talk for a few minutes. <laughs> alcohol is a toxin and, you know, research is finally coming out, confirming that even, you know, wine, you would need to be able, you'd have to drink a truckload of red wine in order to get the benefits of the resveratrol, which comes from the grape skin, right? And what we found with alcohol is it pokes holes in the intestinal tract. Um, and it is, a, it is a toxin. So if you have chronic gut issues, laying off all alcohol is incredibly important. This was a study after out of um, the American College of Gastroenterology showing basically just two, one drink per day for women and two for men could lead to intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So as well as bloating, gas, abdominal pain. So it is something when we're going about gut healing, alcohol, you should be skipping out on giving the body the opportunity to start to heal. All right, you guys. So now we are getting into kind of our 5R approach. It's a very common approach you'll find with functional medicine practitioners. Um, however, Kat and I's approach and what we've seen missed um, is starting with detox or nutritional reset. Because one of the most important things is to start to remove the bad bugs, the foods, the irritants, and provide your body with the building blocks it needs to do it with ease. Otherwise, you can have a lot of really bad die-off symptoms and feel pretty crappy as you're going through this process instead of being able to um, address it really quickly and create some ease in doing so. Step two, you're replacing what's, what's missing, um, some of the things we mentioned before. Step three, you're re-inoculating with some healthy, gut promoting foods, um, as well as bacteria to help promote pre and probiotics. Step four, you're gonna work on repairing the lining of the gut and uh, also improving the function of some digestive organs. And step five is how do we maintain this? And this is the key, maintaining proper digestive health is going to be with lifestyle factors by proper exercise, stress and sleep. All right, so Kat, do you have anything to add? Do you have anything that you wanna talk about kind of on the detox side? Yeah, so the, um, this step one, like Carrie said, that's a little bit, you know, so the, it's called the five R approach. You're gonna hear this a lot from people who like us. So you see the remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair, and rebalance. <clears throat> it's um, a functional medicine approach. Um, but again, like Carrie said, we really focus on this first part, the detox. Um, and that's, it's really key and we're seeing huge benefits from this, right? So we wanna eliminate, reduce incoming toxins, give the body what it needs, like Carrie said, okay? Um, remove the stressors, right? So har the harmful bugs. So um, parasites, yeast, bacteria, inflammatory foods, and the irritants. So here's some examples of what can happen when you start to do that. So this is, uh, Angie, 51 year old female, she came because she said she felt like she was just waiting around to die. <laughs> she felt tired all the time. She had brain fog. Um, she had gut issues. So if you can see closely, it's hard for me to zoom in on this, but this is her, I, I have everyone fill out one of these things. It's called a medical symptom questionnaire. So this one, here's her week, her initial, her initial start one. Here's the middle. 
So after seven days, I had her fill out another one. And after day 14, here's another one. So every time they visit me, I have them fill out another form. And you can see in her digestive tract, she had a 10 here. After seven days, she went down to a six. After day 14, it went down to a three. Okay, so this is how fast this method can work. Um, here she had her emotions look, because the body is always a reflection of the mind and the mind is also always a reflection of the body. So her emotions were a 16 here. In just 14 days, it went down to a four. So she felt like she got back in control of her life. Um, skin issues from a 10, I'm not sure how that, to a four. And then other major areas of mind, poor memory, poor concentration, confusion, difficulty in making decisions. She went from a 14 down to a six. So that's fabulous. <laughs> I don't like know. 70% that... improvement in 70% improvement in her symptoms in 14 days. You yes. Know. And this is, this is standard. I see this all the time. Rarely do I not see this. The only time that I don't see this is when people don't follow what we're saying. And it's very rare because usually people that are coming to us are just like ready, right? They're just ready to feel good. And that's the best, that's the best way to start something like this when you're just ready. Um, okay, so this is another client. Um, she had, she was, she re, she had uh, breast cancer at one point, but she was a breast cancer survivor, but she still was having some issues. So she had poor digestive health. So she was an eight here um, after just two weeks. So after 14 days, she went down to a two. You can see her emotions went from a six to a one. Um, body pain, so joint muscles from five to one. Um, eyes, right? Watery, itchy eyes, swollen, reddened, sticky eyelids, bags or dark circles. She went from a seven to a zero. So an overall score, okay, weight, she went from a 13 to a one. So overall score from 55 to a six in just 14 days. This is the power of functional medicine. This is the power of lifestyle as your medicine. This is the power of when you understand what your body needs. It's so easy. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. It's not easy to do alone, though. So yeah, yeah. it's great to do. Yeah, do, great to do again in a systematic approach. And I think that that's one of the biggest missing steps is we well, have so many people come to us say, "Oh, I've tried this and I've tried this and I've tried this," but it was in the improper order. Literally, just about dressing it in the proper order, you create this cohesive plan where we see exponential improvements and in and success and uh, really starting to heal. So step two has to do with replacing and replacing is really focusing on starting to improve your digestion and your absorption. And some of the most important things we see are adding in digestive enzymes or bile salts to help get the, the gallbladder functioning. As we mentioned, warm water with lemons, start your morning with that. I have seen someone, I had someone who had chronic constipation. That's the only thing we started and migraines, they went away in two weeks. That's all she changed. So we knew she had a sluggish gallbladder and we knew that her digestive fire was low. So um, HCL, betaine with hydrochloric acid can be really helpful, but again, it has to be systematic in how you would add it in. Nutrients, everything from iron to B vitamins to magnesium and zinc. Um, getting your um, mineral levels up, incredibly important because we see most people are demineralized. So adding in sea salt, cooking with sea salt, adding sea salt in your water, um, is helpful. And then follow a gut friendly diet that can help you feed and replace those nutrients. Kat, you want to do this one? Okay. So uh, step three is re-inoculate um, with beneficial bacteria. So here you can do it with supplementation. So certain probiotics, right? But probiotics that will actually be, be beneficial for you, but also it's really about eating the right foods. Right, so you can eat foods rich in fermentable fiber, like tubers, plantains, chicory root, lentils, legumes, and potatoes. Jicama is really good. Um, so there's certain prebiotic supplementation um, products out there, like bio, Biotogen's or Claire, Biotogen by Claire Labs. We had a picture of that on here. I, Arbon has a good um, fiber uh, that's tasteless and odorless. You can put it on your food. You can put it in your protein shakes in the morning. Uh, probiotic rich foods like vegetables, cultured vegetables and kefir. Bone broth is really nourishing. It's got important amino acids that help 
um, maintain the lining of the gut wall and miso soup, okay? Um, so I like to do what's called a probiotic parade when I'm helping people. And this is where we alter, we rotate the num probi different strains of probiotics every single night. So every night you're taking a different type of probiotic. Um, and that helps give you that diversity that we're looking for, right? So that's something I use very often in the protocols I use with clients. Um, antibiotics, if you're taking antibiotics, it's good to take something called Sac boulardii, which is actually a, a yeast organism, but it acts as a probiotic. So while you're on antibiotics, you can take Sac boulardii, and then after you're off the antibiotics, then you like doing something like a probiotic parade where you're rotating um, certain concentrated pr probiotics as well as like a broad spectrum probiotic uh, for a number of weeks is really helpful. And one of the things that I want to add here is if you do struggle with chronic bloating, <laughs> adding in foods that are rich in fermentable fiber is going to not go well. So again, it has to be done very systematically. You have to address that bacterial overgrowth in the small intestines um, first before starting to add in some of these fermentable fibers. What they found in research recently is the fermentable fiber and resistant starch is actually even more beneficial to increase microbiome diversity. So that's why it's essential. You have to get your small intestine in line so that it can feed your colon, literally, what it needs so that you can create these compounds, particularly something called butyrate, which is the most protective compound against colon rectal cancer. And it is built by proper microbiome balance, right? Having a diverse group of microbiome as well as adding in, being able to digest and absorb resistant and fermentable starches. Okay. All right, step number four, um, repair digestive function. And these are some of our favorite nutrients. So bone broth, you can buy bone broth at the store. Um, there are actually some decent brands out there right now. Um, Butcher is one that you can get even at Costco that has a decent bone broth. Um, there are some bone broth packets that are basically freeze dried bone broth and they actually taste fairly decent. Otherwise you can make your own bone broth just by simmering. I use a rotisserie, ch organic rotisserie chicken carcass and we'll use my um, crock pot, adding in some really high quality purified water, minerals, a bunch of different herbs and apple cider vinegar and you simmer it for 24 hours and strain it. And you've got a beautiful stock that's basically been infused with minerals and amino acids. Zinc L-carnosine, it is a incredible game changing nutrient that speeds up gut healing, particularly the lining. It, it has been shown to actually heal ulcers. Um, very, very amazing at, at healing the lining of the gut. Omega-3 fatty acids, you know, decrease inflammation in the body and help with the healing aspects of the body. L-glutamine, L-glutamine. Again, this is one of those nutrients. People go, I've been taking L-glutamine. That's at the end end of your healing process for the most part, for most people, because it can be very hard to uh, start to assimilate initially unless you've done some preliminary gut healing first. Licorice room, slippery, slippery elm, um, aloe for soothing the mucosal lining, and then immunoglobulins, um, which help with your immune support. Okay, so here's a 30-day gut gut reboot package. So if you just want to try to some, get some relief on your own, this is a really good package. So it has gastromen, which has um, uh, zinc mal carnosine. Z yeah, yeah, it has the zinc carnosine in it. And it also has something called mastica gum. So it's really good for soothing. It's an anti-inflammatory for the digestive system, really good at getting rid of H. pylori. <clears throat> and it has digestive enzymes and then also some liver gallbladder support. This, so this is a 30 day supply here. So you'll get two bottles of the gastromen. One is like a 60 and one is 120 or 120. <clears throat> and then digestive enzymes that you take with each, each meal and then the liver gallbladder support. So this will help you improve your overall fat, protein and carbohydrate digestion. It can, again, soothe, really soothe the gut, soothe the infl inflammation, any inflammation that you have going on in there, balances the stomach acid and minimizes heaviness, stomach pain and fatigue following meals. <clears throat> so 
so great place to start. This is one of the things that we'll start with again, just kind of starting from the top, top down um, to start getting to see if you start getting some relief um, and start work, working with some root causes as well. All right, I was just going to see if we had that link, Carrie. The... We're going to send it in our follow up email. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, so we'll yeah. send it in our follow up follow- our follow-up email, I can't speak. Okay, <clears throat> go ahead, Carrie. <clears throat> yeah, so step five is about rebalancing. And this is about creating a lifestyle that maintains optimal gut function. And you know, it's about creating more ease, really. If you are struggling with an imbalanced digestive tract, right? A lot of times we start looking at how are, how is life flowing for you, literally. Um, so starting to create a lifestyle where there's more flow in your body, where you're chewing your food, where you're not eating when you're stressed, right? You're not sitting down when you're stressed. You're taking a moment of pause, right? Saying grace or giving a blessing over your food helps change the pacing um, as you go through your day to slow things down. Then stress management, meditation, everyone on this planet, every human being on this planet should be meditating daily. Um, It is the decompression button that each one of us needs to weave into our day smart sleep habits, joy spot activities, bringing in more passion and pleasure into your life, restorative exercise rather than exercise that can be punishing, and then maintain a diet chock full of gut supportive nutrients, particularly, right, a lot of those good, obviously veggies, veggies, veggies are going to be feeding and fueling the gut um, and also making sure you're getting out into sunshine and nature. So one thing, you know, if you think about it, when people used to say grace before they ate, when you bring your hands together like this, you automatically calm the nervous system down. So just think about that when you sit down to eat your food. And also if you say a little prayer or whatever, you know, express a little gratitude, that's also going to shift your vibration. So that's going to calm everything down as well. And the joy spot activity is super important these days. We really need to learn how to be playful and to have fun because that also that also raises our vibration and allows more of the energy to flow through us. <clears throat> and so really, you know, what Carrie said is your digestive system is kind of really a reflection about how you've been handling life. Mm-hmm. And in Ayurvedic medicine, they go over this in detail because each organ is representative of how you move through life. So that for I won't go through it, but the the mouth, for example, chewing your food. So if you don't chew well, that means, are you really like processing your life well? Are you really chewing on things? Like really going into things, into things that maybe you need to go into, or are you avoiding things? Maybe you don't chew enough and then it just goes down, right? So you don't process information, you don't process emotions or experiences. Okay, so we have another Mm -hmm. webinar next month. So keep a lookout for that. We're gonna send a replay of this webinar. We're gonna send you the link to the gut bundle if you're interested, but we hope we want you to join us again. And then we have something coming up in September, um, a 90 day program where we're gonna address quite a few of these things, the gut detox and, um, and hormones. And so if you feel like you need extra support, if you don't understand how to do this on your own, which a lot of people don't, that's why we're here. We invite you to join us. It's fun to do it in a group. It's supportive to do in a group. And then you can also help others too. And that always makes us feel good when when we're of service to others. Okay. And, you know, if you're wanting to learn more um, with this, So here's our My High Five Life um, style, and we're going, we'll be giving uh, just some little intros. This is going to be a limited program. Um, We're going to be limited to a small group of individuals. And, um, but if you're wanting to learn more either about the program and, or just wanting to find out if maybe gut testing is right for you, or if working with either cat or eye is right for you right for you. We are offering 20 minute free um, root cause dive consults and you can email, we'll have both this information in our follow-up email. You can email Dr. Kat directly and or me directly um, to see if it makes sense um, to move forward, whether it's in a group program or work individually with us.